Good morning, welcome to Merlin Rise Church. We've got an amazing service for you today. Today, Jim is leading us on a talk about Palm Sunday. Why did Jesus come riding on a donkey? Why were, was everyone waving palm leaves? Um, it's going to be great. I hope you enjoy it. Hand over to Jim. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. An invitation written a thousand years before the event that we remember this morning. A thousand years before Jesus rode through those gates of Jerusalem and a thousand years before that very first Palm Sunday. But an unmistakable nod in that direction. A prophetic finger pointing forward far into the future, tracing the footsteps of Jesus hundreds of years before they came to be. But next comes, perhaps rather unexpectedly, an interesting question. Who is this King of Glory? Who's he, this King of Glory? Who is he? And it's a kind of question which men and women have been asking themselves ever since they walked the earth. In other words, what price glory? What is real glory? What's glory all about? How do you get glory? What is real glory? The Romans, under whose empire that first Palm Sunday happened, they had no doubt. You won glory in battle at the head of a conquering army. And in a way, your glory was weighed in corpses. The most famous conqueror of all, uh, Julius Caesar, was a man of soaring ambition for glory. He conquered Gaul, today's France, uh, and Thousands upon thousands of Gauls generously contributed to Julius Caesar's quest for glory with their lives. And then he wrote about it all at some length, uh, and not least to the huge dismay of millions of schoolboys and schoolgirls who were condemned to read what he wrote in Latin. But basically, you can sum it all up in about four words, because um, the summary, really, of Caesar's Gallic Wars, all those pages and pages, is simply this, Aren't I great? Aren't I great? Uh, And conquests like these led to a triumph. It gave you the right to have a triumph in Rome, uh, the ultimate honour. You marched in state through the streets of Rome. You were followed by your captives. Uh, You were admired by adoring and applauding crowds. And at the end, all those rows of captives either got sold into slavery or if they were important captives they kind of had the honour of being strangled at the end of it. That was glory. Much later, in in what we might now call old Europe, um, noblemen prized their glory. It was a must-have accessory. It was the ultimate status symbol because it said what you were worth. It was your dignity. And it was very brittle. So a perceived insult to your dignity, to your glory, meant pistols at dawn the next day. Um, In the mid-19th century, there were two young German army officers who were competing for the hand of uh, a rather attractive and gracious lady, and um, a rich lady too, because she was a countess. And one of these officers suggested that the other one's nose was a trifle petite, a bit small. Uh, That didn't go down well, and it meant a shootout. And by the next morning, two young lives had needlessly been thrown away. You see, they were soldiers. They were crack shots. They hit each other. Now, that's terribly sad. But of course, there is more than a whiff of battle uh, in Psalm 24, where those words I just began with came from. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. The world of 3,000 years ago, when that was written, was a cutthroat world. And these Psalms of David are carved out of that world. Israel was an embattled nation. Uh, It was struggling to establish itself in a good land. Remember, that was the land flowing with milk and honey. But of course, it was a coveted land, the envy of plenty of well-armed rivals and claimants. And against all odds, Israel survived. Israel succeeded, Israel flourished, and that was David's lived experience. There were battles to fight, and he'd fought them, and he'd felt the hand of God beside him and behind him at his back. 
Remember, at a tender age, he'd put his life on the line to face down a supersized human killing machine called Goliath and miraculously and gloriously come through the experience in one piece. So you can see why David writes this kind of thing. He was a child of his time, as is every single one of us. We're all children of our time, aren't we? Something I think in our society today we might do rather well to remember. And this was his lived experience. But there's something else in Psalm 24. There's that forward-pointing finger, a finger pointing forward to another king and to a different kind of battle and to a whole different kind of glory. And that's the glory we contemplate this morning, the glory that we contemplate when we remember Palm Sunday. A couple of historical figures will help to point the moral for us. These are some of my favourite sayings. I think I might have referenced them at least once before. So if you've heard me say something like this before, uh, I apologise. But these, these things really do inspire me. Uh, the first gentleman is uh, Godefroy de Bouillon. <laughs> Godefroy de Bouillon had a whopper of a castle on a rocky outcrop towering over a huge bend in the river Meuse uh, with a little settlement growing along the banks below. And all of it surrounded by the hills and forests of what is today Belgium. If you're on your way through Belgium in the car and you fancy a detour, it's well worth it. It's a hidden gem. The castle is still a whopper today. Uh, but uh, Bouillon was not Godfroy or Godfrey's only domain. He had another domain. Far, far away, you might say, from the green, green grass of home. That other domain was Jerusalem. Godefroy de Bouillon uh, is recorded as the first king of Jerusalem in 1099. Now, of course, we know, don't we, that he wasn't really the first. I mean, there's David in that line of succession. And even before David, if you turn back to Genesis, you've got Melchizedek, who will really lay that claim. But that's how Godefroy de Bouillon has gone down in history, and king he was except for one thing. He was king except for one thing. He was never crowned. He refused to wear a crown. He said, I will not wear a crown of gold in the city where my Lord wore a crown of thorns. Now, of course, he was a, he was a crusader, uh, and uh, the rights and wrongs of the crusades are many and are much debated. But for that remark and that choice not to wear the crown, I honour him. He got that right. He was on the button. Now, uh, over 900 years flow by, and somebody else turns up at the gates of Jerusalem. Another soldier with another army at his back. This time it's the British army. It's the end of World War I. Now, for centuries, the Holy Land and Jerusalem have been in Ottoman hands, in other words, under Turkish rule. And in the First World War, Turkey was aligned with Germany, so that at the end of the war, it fell to the British army to take Israel. And at their head, General Edmund Allenby. There are streets in Israel st still carrying the name of this man. Now, years before, uh, the Kaiser had been to Jerusalem, the German Kaiser. Uh, of course, the German Kaiser wasn't all German. His mum was English, so he was part English. But when, um, when he got to Jerusalem, he entered on a great white charger in huge pomp with a massive procession so big that they had to demolish part of the ancient wall of Jerusalem to let him in. General Allenby didn't do that. He, he dismounted. He got off his horse and he walked quietly in through a side gate. And he's quoted as saying, I will not enter on horseback where my Lord came on a donkey. I will not enter on horseback where my Lord arrived on a donkey. Good man. Spot on. Now, Allenby was no softy, by the way. His nickname was the Bull. He was a tough army commander. But I admire those with power who are big enough to be humble. Those with power who are big enough to be humble. And I think as we think about that, we're getting closer to real glory. Maybe the glory lies not so much in the power, but in the humility. Not in the power, but in the humility. And we turn our minds this morning, therefore, to the one to whom all power and authority is given. The hands that shaped the highest mountain and the feet that trod the furthest star. 
the mind that stretches down the ages of eternity, the Lord Almighty, the King of glory of Psalm 24. And he comes, not on a white charger, not with a procession, not in great pomp, but on a gentle donkey, the symbol of peace and modesty. Now, you know this story well, but the story starts with Jesus making this very controversial decision when he's far away from Jerusalem to set his face back towards Jerusalem, to go back to Jerusalem. His disciples are dumbfounded. You cannot be serious, they gasp. Last time you went there, they tried to kill you. You can't go back there. That's madness. But Jesus has a different agenda. He actually takes the time to explain it to them. He lays it out before them in minute detail. He tells them exactly how it's all going to happen. His betrayal, his rejection by the priests and the Pharisees. He tells them about his handing over to Pilate long before it happens. He tells them that he'll be mocked and insulted and spat upon and killed. You can read it, it's all there. And of course it includes the final word that on the third day he will rise again. And it seems that his disciples at that moment really just couldn't quite swallow it, couldn't get their heads around it. It was only after his death that it all began to click into place for them. But Jesus knew it all along. And so to Jerusalem they go. But first stop is Bethany, just a couple of miles from the city where Jesus' friend Lazarus, gravely ill, has in the meantime passed away. And in fact, when Jesus arrived, he's been in the tomb for four whole days. His sisters are beside themselves with grief. So much so that famously, Jesus himself weeps. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords takes time to share the tears of his friends. He did it then, and he does it still. He was alongside Mary and Martha in their grief, and he's alongside you in your grief, and me in mine when those times come. He cries your tears, he shares your, your, your pain, and he shares mine. But in our story, all is not lost, because Jesus is the Lord of the empty tomb. And before long, Lazarus' tomb is empty as he's raised to life again. And now Lazarus appears to have been quite a well-known man and his family appear to have been quite well-known because we're told that many Jewish people had come to comfort the two sisters. So that this remarkable miracle has been performed not on the quiet, not hidden away, but before actually quite a big audience. And as a result, we're told that many put their faith in Jesus. And the word spreads. It's headline news. The temperature rises. And in no time, it's all over Jerusalem, just two miles down the road. And of course, it's in the ears of the priests and the Pharisees. And the priests and the Pharisees, the Jewish priests and Pharisees, are worried men. They're afraid that Jesus is going to start a revolution and that would bring the might of Rome crashing down on little Israel. They're wrong. They're so wrong, but they're in panic mode. And then come the fateful words of the high priest Caiaphas, who says to his colleagues, it is better that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. It's better that one man should die for the people than the whole nation should perish. And of course, that one man is Jesus. So Jesus raises Lazarus to life and the Pharisees condemn him to death. When you think about it, there is a huge irony in this. What the Pharisees wanted was peace. They were afraid of of Rome. What Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, wanted was peace. It was his job to keep the peace. So the Pharisees who wanted peace, and Pontius Pilate who wanted peace, above all, managed to put the Prince of Peace to death. The unstoppable machinery clicks forward another notch as Calvary comes a step nearer. Uh, <clears throat> and we next find Jesus uh, about six days before the Passover back in Bethany and now the guest of honour at a dinner at the house of a man known as Simon the leper we don't know who he was really but of course he, he, had he still been a leper he couldn't have been hosting this grand dinner so commentators have assumed that Simon had at some point been healed by Jesus it's a reasonable assumption 
And Lazarus is a fellow guest. And one imagines this might be a, a celebration of Lazarus's dramatic resurrection. And this is the famous moment when Mary pours a jar of priceless perfume uh, at Jesus' feet, prompting some to comment on such a scandalous waste of money and prompting Jesus to say that she's anointed him for burial. And so as he says those words, the shadow of a cross grows a few inches longer. But Jesus, and and now Lazarus it seems, are public figures. And before long there's a big crowd around this house and the fears of the chief priests are ramped up even further. But not nearly as much as they are by the events of the next day. Jesus sets out from Bethany, across the top of the Mount of Olives, and down towards Jerusalem. It's about just a couple of miles. There's already an enthusiastic crowd around him. Many of those people are probably the Lazarus fan club, his friends and his acquaintances, and those who've come to see the spectacle of the dead man walking. Jesus sends ahead into a village on the top of the mount to procure himself a donkey. He's got it all arranged. He's seen it all coming. He's in charge. He's engineering the scene. And famously, on this donkey, the symbol of humility, the symbol of modesty, of non-self-projection, of non-look-at-me, aren't I great? Everything that's the opposite of that. On this donkey, the king of kings enters his holy city. By this time, the news of his coming has reached Jerusalem ahead of him. And now the crowds flood out to meet him en route. Using palm branches and even their own cloaks, they're giving him the red carpet treatment. There are people everywhere. There's stuff all over the road. The progress is triumphant, but slow. You know, I've often imagined this scene as a kind of welcoming committee, waving a few palms as Jesus covers those last few yards up to the city gates. It wasn't like that. It was much more like a football team bringing home the cup uh, you know, on, on top of a, a double-decker bus to the packed crowds that are lining the streets. It was euphoria. It was mass hysteria. It was pandemonium growing by the minute. You could see it all from the city walls as that human wave swept down the hill opposite. And as those voices swelled to a crescendo and the loud hosannas rang, the chief priests, looking on from afar, renewed their determination to seal Jesus' fate. The whole world has gone after him, they said. It must have been quite a spectacle. And they couldn't have a spectacle like that. And this, of course, explains the importance of Judas' betrayal. You see, they desperately wanted to arrest Jesus, but they didn't dare for fear of this massive crowd. They thought it would provoke a riot. And so they decided to wait until after the Passover feast, because at at the Passover feast, Jerusalem was full of visitors. And they decided to wait until after the Passover, when Jerusalem would have emptied out. So something changed their minds. And that was Judas, turning up with his insider offer to deliver Jesus to them by night. You see, this was a world without street lamps. Night was night. There would be no crowd, no fuss, complete darkness, and little or no resistance. And that was an offer they couldn't refuse. And in their state of panic, any price was worth paying. And so history's most precious life is sold for 30 pieces of silver. Why the donkey then? Why the donkey? Well, well, kings and generals rode horses. Horses were, if you like, the tanks of ancient warfare. They were beasts of battle. Donkeys were the opposite. They were beasts of peace. The prince of peace is on the road. The prince of peace is at the gates. But not just the prince of peace. You see, this was a farming community. This was an agrarian society. And donkeys were the beasts of burden the beasts that people used in everyday working life. They were the beasts that were owned by ordinary people. And so this donkey says that the almighty God, the beautiful saviour and the great redeemer is the friend of ordinary people, the friend of the unnoticed, the unfamous, the uncelebrated and the unsung. 
the friend of, of, of you and I. I hope I haven't undervalued you by saying that. But uh, you know, the, the unknown are not unknown to him, and you and I certainly aren't. So in this scene of the donkey, you have this beautiful picture of the omnipotent God, the everlasting Father, for whom nobody is too small, for whom nobody is too low, for whom nobody is too insignificant, because to him everyone and everything counts. He is the Lord of all things and of all people. So that donkey is a beautiful picture. But what about the palms? Well, for many years, the Greeks and Romans had used palms as a symbol of victory. They were given to winners in athletic contests. They were used in the original Olympics. And that symbolism still survives today. If you're a film buff, you'll know that the winners at the Cannes Film Festival get the Palme d'Or, the golden palm. And the French word that's linked with that, palmarès, means a list of winners. It means an honours board or even, if you like, a hit parade. And so that enthusiastic crowd that laid the palms at Jesus' feet were anticipating some kind of a victory. For many of them, it might well have been victory over the Roman occupation. And that was what the chief priests were afraid of. Well, indeed, victory was in the offing. Jesus was on the verge of history's greatest victory. Not over the Romans. This was going to be a different kind of victory, and it would take him to a cross. And on that cross, Jesus would once for all claim the victory over sin and death. He would once for all disarm the powers of evil, once for all pay the price of human shortcomings, and once for all set his people free and open the way to eternal life, confirmed by the folded grave clothes and the empty tomb. Do you sometimes feel weighed down by maybe things that have not gone right for you in your life? Maybe what you later look on as as maybe your failures, Or do you sometimes feel troubled by your sins and your shortcomings and sometimes the stuff you you struggle to shake off and that you know is not your best, if you like? Do you sometimes feel weighed down by the fact that, well, you just don't quite feel good enough? Uh, And sometimes you might look around church and look at some very holy people and think, oh, they're all much better than me. You know, I think we've all had that experience sometimes. I, I certainly have. If you have, turn to the cross and repent. In other words, say sorry, say sincerely sorry, and let the burden roll away. Know that every sin on him was laid, so that you and I can be set free. No wonder they shouted Hosanna. Hosanna meant save us, and that's exactly what Jesus was just about to do, but on a cross. And one more thing, those palms in the ancient world had another meaning. They were symbols of eternal life. And when Jesus spoke those famous words on the cross, when he said, it is finished, as he hung on the cross, that wasn't a cry of despair. I used to always think it was. That was no cry of despair. It was a cry of victory. It meant that the job was done. It is finished. It's all sorted. It's done. And it means eternal life if you and I will put our trust in him. So Jesus had come to Jerusalem to claim history's ultimate victory. No wonder they shouted Hosanna to welcome the saviour of mankind and people kind, humankind. No wonder they laid palms beneath his feet. What they were about to witness was real glory, real glory. Lift up your heads over your gates and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord Almighty, the Son of God, who lays his glory down and surrenders to the horrors of the cross and three days later picks it up again to reign forevermore. He is the King of glory. Is this then the Lord strong and mighty in battle? Well, yes, it is, because this is a battle. No ordinary battle, not a military battle. There are no earthly armies fighting here. This is the ultimate battle, the battle over sin and death and hell. And as Jesus hangs on that terrible cross, the battle is won. You know, human battles, when you read through history, it strikes you that human battles are often won at the cost of many lives and to be reversed a few weeks or months or days afterwards. 
This battle is forever. It can't be reversed. It's finished. Once for all, the price is paid. Fought the fight, the battle won. Love's redeeming work is done. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and sing Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to your king. And finally, as we close, there is another gate to be lifted up, another door to be opened. And once again, Jesus comes and approaches from the outside. And the book of Revelation has Jesus speaking and saying and talking, this time not to Pontius Pilate, not to the chief priests, not to his disciples. This time, he's talking to people in general and to you and to me. And he says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, the King of glory will come in. He's still humble. He stands at the door. He won't beat that door down. He won't smash it down. You and I have the key from the inside. (coughs) And so will I, will you this morning, lift up the gates of your heart and your life. Will you open the door of your heart this morning so that the King of glory can come in, can come in to eat with you. In other words, to to walk with you, to do life with you, to be part of your life, to be beside you and behind you and before you for as long as life shall last. Will you open that door so that he can come in, not just for that, but to shine his light upon you forever and ever. Lift up the everlasting door so that the King of glory can come in. We're going to pray. Let's pray. We'll, we'll close our eyes and I'm just going to pray a short prayer, a few words. Um, it's my prayer in many ways. But if you would like to make it your prayer this morning, would you like in your own mind to pray it with me? Um, whether it's perhaps the first time that you've considered this and whether you want to say to Jesus for the first time, come into my life. That would be great. Maybe you said that long ago and you've gone a bit cold, you've kind of uh, let things drop a bit, uh, you feel a bit stale and you want to renew that invitation this morning. This is the invitation that you're welcome to make. So if that's you, then pray this prayer with me, if you will, just in the quiet of your own mind. And if you do, would you just like to, um, I don't want to embarrass you in any way, but would you like to just briefly uh, raise your hand if you're praying that prayer with me as I pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful picture uh, of you coming into our lives. And we want to pray this morning that we will have the grace to open those gates, open that everlasting door so that you may come into our life and bless us, that you may make our lives beautiful and worthwhile and enjoyable, and not just for now, not just for today, but forever. And we ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed that amazing sermon. Um, If anything touched you at all or you'd like prayer, please contact us on the email address. Um, Hope to see you next week.